Well, good morning, everybody. And I have the pleasure to introduce the first speaker today, John Adams. Uh, John serves as the director of Safe Stonehenge World Heritage Site and also uh, chairman of Stonehenge Alliance and uh, people who have been following what we've been sharing on sacred earth activism over the last year will have seen the work by these organizations, all kind of led by a small team, but have been the groups that have spearheaded and led these tireless campaigns and legal challenges, which have so far been the only thing that has stopped the desecration and devastation there of these tunnels and um, expressways that have been planned and proposed at Stonehenge. We're very fortunate to have John joining us today to share kind of insights from what's been happening with this campaign, what the scheme really entails, and why the revered status of this ancient monument as a sacred world heritage site is currently under threat. So we're really, really grateful for John to be here today and to give us kind of updates and more information on, on this uh, on this campaign. Um, we are talking about Stonehenge, which itself needs no introduction. Um, but we'd like to just start this talk with a uh, a video just to, to set the stage. So welcome, John. Really good to see you. And thank you for coming along this morning. And uh, I'll start just with the, the video here. So I hope that kind of helps wherever people joining in around the world connect with that that amazing sacred landscape of Stonehenge. And really, really good to have you with us here this morning to 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 share about this, John. Really good to see you. Um, I wondered if you'd be able to just start um kind of giving a bit of the the background with this and telling us about the Stonehenge Alliance, um, what the overall campaign is for, and just giving a bit of background for for people who are watching this morning. Yes, indeed. Um, uh, uh, but firstly, thank you for that very warm welcome, Jonathan and Krista. Um, and thank you for producing that beautiful little video, um, uh, Jonathan. It sets the scene, I think, for what we're talking about this morning. But good morning to uh, everyone that's online. Um, I'm speaking from the English county of Wiltshire for those outside of the UK. And where I'm speaking from is sitting, it's a small town sitting just underneath Salisbury Plain, as it were. And we're about 21 miles from Stonehenge itself here. And um, for those who uh, know about these things, we're in the heart, right in the heart of the ancient kingdom of Wessex. So Jonathan, thank you. The Stonehenge Alliance is, and I'm conscious that many people will know quite a lot about this campaign and will have followed it over the years and maybe others won't know so much. But the Stonehenge Alliance is an informal grouping of people and organisations. In your introduction, Jonathan, you made it sound as though it was had quite a big structure, but we're a tiny, tiny organisation. Um, and what we want to do, of course, is to protect the World Heritage Site. In a nutshell, we're opposed to all development in the World Heritage Site, which will cause it harm. 
So again, for those living outside of the UK, we've been battling uh, against uh, this road scheme that the government wants to build for more than 20 years. So take heart, those of you who have got your own battles in your own backyard, 20 years is an extraordinary time. And I, clearly I've not been involved in all for that whole period, but 20 years is a long time to be running a campaign so this is really a story about um, environmental activism, uh, about persistence and a uh, huge commitment on behalf of one or two very, very special people. So we're a not-for-profit organization and I'm sure that's um, uh, common with many uh, of the activists online. We have no regular income, uh, we have no paid staff, uh, and we just have a handful, I mean, less than five of active members. And yet, nevertheless, we've managed through our combined efforts to delay this wretched road by several years. Uh, and just briefly aside, every year that we delay it, the costs go up. So increases pressure on the government uh, to uh, not proceed with it. Um, the long-term supporter organizations of the Alliance include an organization called the Ancient Sacred Landscape Network, a campaign to protect rural England, and uh, people in England will know all about CPRE, Rescue, the British Archaeological Trust, Friends of the Earth, and a small organization called Transport Action Network, which punches well above its weight. So through the Save Stonehenge World Heritage Site campaign, which Jonathan mentioned, the Alliance is concentrating its efforts on opposing the proposal for dueling the major road to Devon and the Southwest, turning the single carriageway into dual carriageway. Um, that's the A303, including a short tunnel where it crosses the World Heritage Site. This scheme was originally announced in December 2014, this particular scheme. And we and others um, say it would cause and will cause serious damage to this unique landscape. Stonehenge Alliance supported the two legal challenges to the road scheme, which we'll talk a bit more about, I hope, later on. Um, and we'll continue to support those challenges if necessary. Um, also, over the years, over these many years, we've responded to numerous consultations. <clears throat> many of these responses have been highly technical. Uh, these are not responses produced in, you know, a day or two. They are very technical. They could run to perhaps 30, 40, 50 pages in length. Um, and a lot of research has to go into them. So we've produced lots of these consultation responses. And we also uh, were an important uh, witness giving evidence at the planning examination, the planning inquiry, which I'll talk a bit about later. We also have, and again, this will be familiar to campaigners, we have an international petition that was handed into the, the seat of British government at 10 Downing Street by our president, Tom Holland, the historian, writer and broadcaster, who I'm sure many people will know of. Um, and in the little video you just saw, you saw Tom standing outside of number 10, handing in the petition. Well, that was a little while ago. We now have 236,000 signatures. Uh, and if you haven't already signed the petition, then the one thing I would ask you to take away today is to make a note to sign that petition, which you can find on our website. And perhaps, uh, Jonathan, at some point, we can put the link into the chat as well. Um, and again, please urge your friends to um, uh, sign as well. It's, uh, it's important. So we also briefly then, we uh, raise awareness of the likelihood of Stonehenge's loss of World Heritage Site status. And this is a key point. World Heritage Site status is designated by UNESCO uh, and UNESCO has condemned this road scheme uh, and its advice 
continues regrettably to be ignored by the British government. Uh, it seems to me and uh, our supporters extraordinary that uh, a British government could just choose to ignore UNESCO. So in a nutshell, our single overriding objective is to stop this road from being built. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of the road uh, just to cheer you up a little bit later on. OK, Jonathan. Oh, super. Thank you for, for that comprehensive background of it all there and you mentioned on that last point about kind of the note about it being a world heritage site uh, there's lots of different names that people might kind of talk about when they talk about Stonehenge as being an ancient monument as a sacred site but that designation of of world heritage site by UNESCO is really quite important I wonder if you'd just be able to um, share a bit more about what that that specific designation means and how it how it affects this this campaign with Stonehenge Gladly, gladly, Jonathan. And uh, again, for people listening, watching this, um, as it were, discussion about the World Heritage Site is crucial, really. Um, I mean, fundamentally, a World Heritage Site, and of course, we'll all know of World Heritage Sites, you know, sometimes we drive into them, we drive out and you think, well, what was that, what was that all about? Uh, but we all know about them. But it's an area or a building or a place with legal protection um, and I think we've got the slide, Jonathan, we could put up there. Uh, but it's an area with legal protection through an international convention, which is administered by UNESCO. And crucially, the UK, the is, UK a is a sig the signatory. The, sig uh, the UK is a signatory to this convention. Can you still hear me all right, Jonathan? I can still hear you, yep. Yeah, good, OK. So the UK is a signatory to this convention. World Heritage is uh, the designation for places on Earth that are of outstanding value to humanity. I mean, that phrase alone captures so much and has so much power within it, uh, an outstand outstanding value to humanity. And uh, to be, and if, if it's been inscribed on the World Heritage List, a place by UNESCO, they should be protected for future generations to appreciate and learn for, from. Now, as I say, we all know of uh, World Heritage Sites, but places as diverse as the pyramids of Egypt, the Great Barrier Reef in, in Australia, the Taj Mahal in India, the Grand Canyon in the US, or the Acropolis in Greece. And those are just a few examples, and I could list more of the more than a thousand sites which are inscribed on the World Heritage List. The, site, the sites, just as an aside, the sites are not all beautiful places. For example, the Nazi concentration camp Auschwitz is a World Heritage Site. Nominated sites must, to use uh, UNESCO language for a moment, they must be of outstanding universal value. This is a key phrase that UNESCO has developed. And, it, and that means that the place or the building or the area, the landscape has got to meet uh, explicit standards. And to qualify, each place that's been nominated must meet at least one of 10 criteria which uh, UNESCO has developed. And they include, for example, that the site uh, represents a masterpiece of human creative genius. Or for example, it bears a unique um, uh, or exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living or has disappeared. So the point being is that the World Heritage Sites are not an arbitrary designation. This is not just something dreamt up. Places, buildings, landscapes are given the most careful consideration and have to meet these explicit UNESCO standards. After all, and I'm sure people, this will resonate with people, <clears throat> heritage, if you think about it, is our shared legacy from the past, what we live with today uh, and what we pass on to future generations. So we believe that our cultural and our natural heritage are both irreplaceable 
sources of life and sources of inspiration. So World Heritage Sites, I really want to, you know, as it were to labor, but to reinforce this point, World Heritage Sites are globally significant. And in the case of Stonehenge, not just significant for the UK and not just for the current generation. These are important points. As I said earlier, UNESCO has condemned this road scheme and it said at its meeting in Saudi Arabia last September that unless the road scheme is modified, it will consider adding Stonehenge to the list of World Heritage properties in danger. And that's a first step to delisting the World Heritage Site or Stonehenge as a World Heritage Site. Incidentally, I can't believe I'm saying this, but incidentally, only three World Heritage Sites have ever been delisted. And one of those was Liverpool Maritime Mercantile City in the United Kingdom. That was delisted in 2021. If Stonehenge is now delisted, what would that say to the world and to countries that are le much less stable than the UK? What would that say about them preserving and looking after their heritage if Stonehenge should be delisted? Now, Stonehenge itself is a World Heritage, heritage Site along with Avebury and their surrounding landscapes. And they were designated a joint, there's a joint designation. They were designated a World Heritage Site in 1986 uh, because of their unique Neolithic and Bronze Age, Bronze Age monuments and sites which date back some 6,000 years. Just briefly, for anyone who doesn't know Avebury, it's located about 18 miles north of Stonehenge. And then I, if you've not been there, I urge you to visit. It was a marvelous Neolithic henge monument containing three stone circles around the lovely village of Avebury. And it's one of the best known prehistoric sites in Britain. It contains in fact, the largest megalithic stone circle in the world. So it's well mm. worth uh, a day out. It's free to get in, unlike Stonehenge. And you can walk around and spend the whole day there. It's a marvellous place. But let's just come back to Stonehenge itself for a moment. Um, the famous Stonehenge monument, which, of course, you saw in Jonathan's little video at the beginning, uh, stands at the heart of and is inseparable from an expanse of chalk uh, downland remarkable for its evidence of our distant ancestors, um, remarkable of the uh, evidence it provides of their homes, their living spaces, farming, working and ceremonial practices. And it's described by UNESCO as a landscape without par parallel. So perhaps the most important thing to understand is that Stonehenge World Heritage Site is much, much, much more than the monument, as marvelous as that monument is. Um, the World Heritage Site is six and a half thousand acres in size, which is a huge tract of land. That's over 10 square miles. And it's the setting for the densest uh, complex of Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments in England, including several hundred burial mounds. Jonathan, I think you've got a slide there of the burial yeah. mounds. Just to help put that into context in terms of the kind of the wider landscape that's uh, that you did send me that picture along. So if I just cut forward on here a couple. There we are. Is it one of are these these are just the, these are some of the burial mounds here. Yeah. They've all been documented. They've all they're all listed and so on and so forth. Um, it's internationally important for the sheer number and scale of its prehistoric monuments. Um, Jonathan, there's another slide, a sort of green colored slide. Do you want to put that up? That's it, the next one. I just wanted yeah. to highlight with the uh, the mouse where Stonehenge is in the center here. Yes. To yeah. show how that kind of relates with the rest of the landscape around it Thank of you. all of these connected sites. Thank you. And then oh, this one here. So this, so this um, slide, starts to show the sheer number and scale of the prehistoric monuments. And you can see Stonehenge pretty much bang in the middle of the 
slide just above the red dotted line there. And there are features such as the avenue, which you can see. You can see the river on the right hand side, that's the River Avon. And you, the avenue leads from the River Avon all the way up to Stonehenge. And that would have been a ceremonial uh, way uh, for our ancestors to have reached Stonehenge. Above that, above Stonehenge, you can see, uh, 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 you can see the cursus. Um, I'll just, well, I'll come to that. I'll come back to that in a second. Hang on. Um, so these monuments and the landscapes that they sit in demonstrate Neolithic and Bronze Age ceremonial and mortuary practices resulting from around 2000 years of continuous use and monument building between around 3700 BC and 1600 BC. As such, they represent a unique example of our collective heritage. So I've said that Stonehenge itself is one of the most impressive prehistoric monuments in the world on the account of its sheer size of its megaliths, the sophistication of its architectural design, the shaping of the stones and the precision with which it was built. So there's an exceptional survival of prehistoric activity here including, as you can see on this slide, burial grounds and large constructions of earth and stone. These would have been of major significance to those who created them. Absolutely central. How could they be otherwise, given the huge investment of time and effort that they represent? They provide an insight and their evidence of prehistoric technology architecture and astronomy. The careful sighting of monuments in relation to the landscape helps us to better understand the Neolithic and Bronze Age, Bronze Ages. And then just to say that driving along the A303, and that's the red line in the middle there, or rather it's the green line, I should say, just above the red line, driving along that main road, the A303, which runs past Stonehenge, within about 200 meters of Stonehenge, it, it's easy perhaps to think, all too easy, that this is perhaps a rather unremarkable tract of land. It doesn't, for example, boast any spectacular hills. It has few ancient trees and is for the most part intensively farmed. But the fact is, this is a truly remarkable landscape with features which I've mentioned as the avenue, a ceremonial route, and, and the cursus, which I started to talk about, and just will say, it's an earthwork, which is a roughly, and it will give you a good idea of the scale of this slide. It's roughly three kilometers long, and it's up to 150 meters wide. Excavations in 2007 uh, dated the construction of the curs cursus to several hundred years, several hundred years before the earliest phase of Stonehenge in 3000 BC. And yet very, very few visitors ever see or are, are aware of these um, sites. So the whole of this landscape is in a sense planned and deliberate. For example, it's been suggested that the Stonehenge Cursus acts as a boundary between areas of settlement and ceremonial activity. It's also aligned remarkably on the equinox sunrise which rises over the Eastern Long Barrow. Some of these structures are now hardly visible, but our ancestors appear to have had an extraordinary awareness of the topography and spatial qualities of this landscape and their monument building and their burial mounds imbued it with ceremonial and perhaps sacred significance which we can barely understand today. So we say the construction of a huge road and tunnel across this unique landscape, bang in the middle of a World Heritage Site can only serve to harm this landscape and likely diminish our understanding further. Thank you, Jonathan. Do you want to just put up the Tony Robinson slide?
Yes, I think I have that one. <coughs> oh no, I don't have that one here. Is don't worry, don't worry, one? don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'll find it. Don't worry. Um, I've not not got it handy. Just go back to that one that you had. It's dangerous to. Which 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 one? Sorry, the dangers. It's, it's dangerous to plan on the basis. Uh, it's the third one down there, or it's number six. It, that's it. Um, I mean, just very briefly on this, uh, you can read it for yourself. Um, uh, culture and awareness and understanding changes all the time. We know much more about Stonehenge now than we did 20 years ago or even 10 years ago, and certainly more than we knew 50 years ago. And so that that will continue. So... We don't want to say, well, we know everything. We do everything to be known about this ancient landscape. So let's build a road through it. It should be left for people to re to use as a re for research and for future generations to learn from. Okay, thanks, Jonathan. Um, do we want to move on? Yes, this, uh, I, I'm, uh, just you were kind of talking about all of that there to do with the the road that's going through and that was kind of clear to see it on the map and I just wondered if uh, you're able just to explain kind of more what is being proposed and kind of more on those oppositions that there are uh, from from the alliance uh, to it. I will and uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly because there's a number of slides which illustrate what's being proposed and uh, uh, I also think this is probably the section which will depress people most. But I mean, the, I UK, mean, the UK, like uh, the UK, like um, many uh, uh, other countries, the volume of traffic for this road is much greater than the road was ever designed for. And there's a traffic problem across the World Heritage Site, as there are in lots of locations in the UK. Uh, and especially at weekends and holiday time, because as I said, this is a main route leading down to Devon and Cornwall, this far southwest, which is a, a holiday destination for people. And this is an age which we, of course, we know of, we understand. This is an age, unfortunately, where the motor car is king, the motor vehicle is king, no matter what the cost to the environment, to our health and to our children's future, the vehicle must get through. But the government's road widening scheme is the wrong solution in our view. It doesn't work strategically, economically, or from a climate or heritage perspective. For a start, the tunnel is too short and its infrastructure would be vast and intrusive. This is a rural setting. Where the A303 crosses the World Heritage Site, it's about five and a half kilometers wide. Whereas the government is proposing a tunnel, a short tunnel, just over, <clears throat> just over three kilometers long. So you can see that this means that within the World Heritage Site, at either end of the tunnel, there will be long, deep cuttings leading down to the tunnel portals. It will be a very deep tunnel, uh, completely out of character with the rural setting and damaging to the World Heritage Site and we can look at what's being proposed. So the road on the left in this slide is the A303. Some of you will know it well, I'm sure. In the middle foreground there is, World Her is Stonehenge itself. Uh, and uh, it's at this point on the road pretty much uh, where the A303, where the dual carriageway goes down to single carriageway. And so cars that are rushing up in the right-hand lane on the dual carriageway must merge with the traffic on the left. Uh, so that slows everything down and causes stop, start, stop, start. Uh, it's also the point, the very point in the journey when Stonehenge monument comes into view. And so lots of people slow down, understandably, in order to see it. And it's celebrated by many people, the fact that you can see Stonehenge from the road. And these factors, mm -hmm. along with the volume of traffic, causes congestion. Do you want to just go on through, Jonathan? And there, sorry, just go back to that other one. There's a different view, but you can see Stonehenge, in fact, the traffic moving freely there, Stonehenge in the middle, 
And this is all of the landscape you can see there is part of the World Heritage Site. Go to the next slide, please, Jonathan. And here's a slide which shows what's being proposed. The gray line around, pretty much around the outside of it, is the uh, boundary of the World Heritage Site. The black, thick black line through the middle is what's being proposed. Uh, and the dotted line is the tunnel itself. You can see Stonehenge pretty much in the middle there. Um, the express interchange on the left-hand side called Long Barrow Roundabout is right on the boundary of the World Heritage Site. And I'll show you some slides of what that will look like. And at the, on the right-hand side, there's a flyover um, and that part of that flyover will be within the World Heritage Site and just meters, perhaps less than 10 meters from Blick Mead, which some of you will know about. Go to the next slide, please, Jonathan. This is the junction that I was just saying at the Long Barrow end. This is a motorway scale junction. It's massive. You can see the cream line, which uh, follows down from the bottom there, Jonathan, uh, by the field, by the hedges, that's it. So if you were to draw that straight across, that's pretty much the boundary of the current World Heritage Site. And from there to the tunnel entrance, which you can see down here, bottom left, Jonathan, bottom left, there we are. From the boundary to there is about a kilometer, just to give you an idea of the scale. But you can see this is a farming rural setting. Next slide, please, Jonathan. And you can also see this is one of the areas where you've got the mounds yeah, already indeed. kind of reaching right close to the edge. Indeed. Um, just very briefly, uh, the A303 has got a number of sections of single carriageway road. Uh, and so the National Audit Office said in 2019, by doing, as it were, Stonehenge, by dueling Stonehenge, it won't resolve the issue of congestion. And they said that the government's objectives for Stonehenge are unlikely to be met until all of those single carriageway sections are made into dual carriageway. Um, there, isn't, there aren't any plans, only three schemes have been funded. And the one on the left there, the A358, which you can see, which would take people up to the M5 motorway there, the, the uh, double blue line. Um, that's incredibly complicated for them to do. And that's been shelved, as I understand it, for the time being. The one that with the dots around in the middle, that was meant to be completed this spring, but it's about a year behind. So, um, yeah, next slide, Jonathan. That's why we say it doesn't work strategically. So this is the eastern portal. Of course, it's made to look very attractive. Uh, these are slides produced by National Highways. Um, but in fact, uh, a lot of that land where they made it almost look like a park setting is in fact intensively farmed. And you can see from the scale of the cars just how deep that portal is. There will also, of course, have to be fences around it to stop animals getting in. Go to the next slide, please, Jonathan. And this is a slide at the western end where I just showed you where it's a kilometer. So this western end, which is particularly sensitive, and UNESCO have said that this western portal, the tunnel entrance, should be moved to at least the boundary of the World Heritage Site, so it needs to be a kilometre longer. But that's going to be as wide, that portal entrance will be as wide as a football field and as deep mm. as a two-storey house. Uh, so it will be massive. I don't know what will happen when unfortunate an animals stray into that area or if there's a, an incident in the tunnel itself. Do you want to go on, Jonathan? And... Um, that, that, that portal will uh, dwarf the tallest stone at Stonehenge, which is six and a half meters high. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, that's just another view, we can move on. Oh, and this is the planning examination, which was held in public. Um, I won't, I'll come back to that a bit later. John, do you want to go to the next group of slides? So this yes. is just a bit, bit more in detail. So. You can see with our clever um, uh, person that's produced this slide, they've projected, as it were, Stonehenge on the right-hand side. 
But of course, you won't see that. You'll be in a tunnel, but that's where Stonehenge would have been, I guess. Um, next one. And again, this just gives you another sort of view of the World Heritage Site. And you can see that the tunnel is too short to cross the whole of the World Heritage Site. And you can see again, Long Barrow, Long Barrow Junction there. That's pretty much where Jonathan pointed out the Round Barrows uh, and the Western Tunnel entrance and the Eastern Tunnel entrance. So it will take the road underneath about 60% of the World Heritage Site. And we say that's just not long enough. So each of the uh, uh, twin bores will be uh, 11 and a half metres with connecting cross passages at intervals. This is a major construction. It will involve hundreds, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tonnes of concrete and other polluting materials. Next slide, Jonathan. And they'll use machinery like they've done on HS2, which is a, a major infrastructure project in the UK for those unfamiliar. Uh, and this kind of landscape in the bottom left picture, this is what they're proposing for the, for the uh, World Heritage Site. It will be harmed, it will be damaged, um, artifacts, archeology span will be destroyed. Next slide, Jonathan. Again, this is just that gives you a, a sense. But out of this tunnel, which will be mainly through chalk, uh, there will, that will be extracted via the Western portal. And this is important, this point about the chalk. Go to the next one, please, Jonathan. Again, there's a view that, in fact, that picture, some of you may recognize it. That was the construction of the Newbury bypass, which brave and courageous campaigners campaigned for years against. Uh, so there will have to be cleaning operate, operations to reduce the water con content of the chalk and remove phosphates, which occur naturally. And then the question arises, well, what's gonna to happen to all that spoil? Um, it will excavate around, in fact, I think it's around about a million cubic meters of chalk rock. Um, let's look at the next one. And that, if you wonder how much a million or 900,000 uh, is, it's more than three times the volume of Silbury Hill. If we go to the next one, and Silbury is uh, the largest artificial prehistoric mound in Europe. It's part of the Avebury World Heritage Site. Uh, and it was built, well, you can see it was built in stages there um, and it's crucial, but we're talking about three times the size of Silbury Hill. For anyone that's driven past or visited Silbury, you'll know just how big it is. I think you can just see some people that are not meant to be up there, but they're standing on top of Silbury Hill, very small matchstick people, um, which gives you an idea of the scale. Next slide, Jonathan. So they're going to um, uh, put all this spoil, all this uh, chalk that they're digging out west of the World Heritage Site, partly on land between, can you believe this, Parsonage Down National Nature Reserve, I don't know why I laugh, and partly in landscaping of the Winterbourne Stoke Bypass. Let's go to the next one, Jonathan. Um, so that risks damaging the environment in itself, uh, and the tunnel construction, of course, which will take at least five years, will cause massive disturbance and be a major carbon generator. Next one, Jonathan. Um, just to go... Uh, so... We're concerned about pollution with the River Avon, which is a marvelous uh, chalk stream with its uh, tributaries. Uh, and it's only uh, near, it's very nearby as you saw in an earlier slide. Um, let's go to the next one, Jonathan. And the, we're concerned about the stone curlew, which is at the bottom picture of the two birds and the great buster, the, a bird which has been in, reintroduced to, to the to Salisbury Plain in the last 20 years. And will both of these species, uh, the stone curlew in particular, which is a mysterious bird and only, it's only found in a few locations in the UK will be disturbed. And there's no guarantee that they will come back after the wretched tunnel has been built. Okay. Um, as I've said, you know, this, this scheme will affect all of this, uh, these remains. 
and uh, other areas just outside of the uh, World Heritage Site will be covered with this tunnel chalk uh, over a, what they call a geotextile, and that's meant to protect the archaeology beneath. Um, but the chalk downland landscape would be altered forever, and archaeological sites would suffer possible damage from compaction. So I think that gives you, a, 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 you know, an all too illustrated vivid picture of what's being proposed and uh, why we say it is potentially going to be harmful. Indeed, John, you kind of said before you started, you braced us saying it will be the kind of the depressing part of it. And gosh, that is shocking to see the scars on the land that will be caused, the level and depth of devastation that kind of the uh, the, 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 the the tunnel, the boring through is going to be. And you laughed in kind of response to it. I kind of felt my heart go, oh, just we know the land so well over there. And the idea that that might um, be the kind of the future for it is um it's certainly something we want to avoid. And recently has been, uh, you've taken that legal challenge, just uh, mindful of time. I wonder if you would yeah. be able to move on to, to that part and just to yes. ask about the Alliance's involvement with the legal challenge yes. and, um, and, and the stage that's at kind of at the moment so that people can be kind of brought right up to date, please. Yeah, indeed. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I'm conscious of time myself. The, uh, so the Alliance if you like, is the machinery behind the legal challenge. Three supporters, uh, myself and two others, formed a small limited company. And the reason we did that, and that's called Save Stonehenge World Heritage Site Limited, which sounds rather grand, but it's just three of us. Uh, the reason we did that is that with a limited company, you protect yourself from horrendous legal costs if you lose the case, you know, as an individual. Um, it's important that people understand, I think, that a judicial review is only reviewing the lawfulness of the government's decision to grant development consent to this road. Uh, it, in other words, it's concerned with process. It's not concerned with the merits or otherwise of the uh, road scheme itself. So, as I said, three, uh, three of us set up this company. Uh, make, make no mistake, this is, as I describe it, David and Goliath stuff. Three mm. ordinary citizens against the vast resources of government. And I'm sure many of you are involved in similar battles around the world. But I urge you not to give up. Uh, we can have an impact way beyond our size. The, the Alliance mobilized its networks, Jonathan, to publicize this legal challenge and crucially to support the fundraising campaign to pay for the legal costs which amounted to 80,000 pounds. And that's what, that's about a hundred thousand dollars, I guess, US dollars. Um, and uh, incident, incidentally, 80,000 pounds is a heavily reduced legal fee by our very supportive legal team, top barristers. If they were charging their full rate, it would be closer to 300,000. Yeah. The first legal challenge was successful on two grounds. Firstly, the minister making the decision uh, incredibly did not receive any briefing on heritage impacts. I mean, it sounds extraordinary, doesn't it? Um, uh, uh, and um, the judge concluded that the minister uh, therefore could not have formed any conclusion about those heritage impacts. And secondly, the judge considered that it was irrational for the minister not to have drawn conclusion in relation to alternatives particularly given that third parties such as the Alliance had raised about alternatives during examination. The judge said that the circumstances of the World Heritage Site, and he got this right, were wholly exceptional. And in this, and in this case, the relative merits of an alternative tunnel options, i.e. longer tunnel, compared to the Westing cutting and portals were an obviously material consideration for the minister to take into account. So the judgment, I won't go on about the judgment further. It runs to over 60 pages and you can find it on our website if you're interested enough to read it. Uh, but the important thing is that those, those by winning on those two grounds meant that the DCO, the development consent order was quashed. However, four months later, the government and now a new secretary of state, we've had a lot of changes in ministers 
uh, in the last five years in Great Britain, uh, the new Secretary of State announced that he would redetermine the scheme. And that process lasted for around 20 months, following which, believe it or not, the, government, the minister uh, issued another DCO for essentially the same road scheme. So again, Jonathan, I'll cut this short, but the, uh, that meant that we had to raise another 80,000 pounds and a huge, huge thank you to everyone that donated to that appeal. We couldn't have done this without that funding. Uh, so heartfelt thanks to you. And again, you can find the grounds of our current challenge. I won't go into them now, but you can find those on our website um, and they're worth uh, looking at. But um, just to say that one of the grounds is, uh, we say our claim is that it was irrational for the minister to give no weight to the risk that Stonehenge would likely be delisted as a World Heritage Site if the scheme went ahead. And in fact, in the minister's decision letter, he in effect brushed UNESCO aside, which I find shocking. Shall we move to a sort of, sort of conclusion, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I mean, it is shocking, absolutely, kind of with that, that it's it's sad that the government as is seems to have no appreciation for heritage and for the protection of them in that way. Um, but yeah, if, if uh, I believe if you got, had kind of some concluding remarks, I think yeah, we have got you, some questions in the audience for afterwards, but yes, and please. If you've you've got a, and you've got a final slide, I think, there, Jonathan, if you want to put that up. So Stonehenge that was given, that's the, the quote, the very last one. Stonehenge was given to the nation in 1918, following years of private ownership on the condition that local people would still be able to visit free of charge. And in fact, the current charge is about 23, 24 pounds to get in for an adult. So it's no longer free of charge. And the National Trust put up, bought up much of the landscape around Stonehenge during the 20th century, following a national appeal. Um, have you got that slide, Jonathan? Is it the just, uh, the very last the one slide on your... from the National Appeal? Yes, I see yeah. it. Um, despite the tight control over access to the World Heritage Site and the stones that is uh, imposed by English heritage, this landscape belongs to all of us. Um, politicians, as we know, think in short timescales, whereas the Stonehenge World Heritage Site shaped as it was by early people stood through millennia. Use of the motor cars, of the motor car is likely to be radically different in 50 or 100 years from now. Do we really want to see this unique landscape desecrated by such a vast engineering construction just to save a few minutes on journey times? Or do we have a collective responsibility to protect and enhance this place for future generations so that they may discover ancient wisdom. Jonathan, I, don't, I think we, I don't know how many questions we've got, but uh, you may not want to um, go to the video. Uh, you, I'm happy for you to I, I'd, I'd say I'd say sadly, we probably won't have time for sharing the, the other video, but we'll share yeah. it again on our, our page afterwards. Thank um, you. Just to show you kind of the international support for this campaign. Um, we did, I, I kind of spotted loads of questions coming on in throughout. Thank you so much for giving the kind of the background and bringing us up to date on that with the campaign. Um, but there, uh, if I could bring Krista in for, quest for, for bringing some of the questions. I have to unmute myself. We are running out of time. I'm so, so sorry, um, people. There were loads of questions. And I mean, the overall response was, of course, this, this just cannot happen. We are appalled. This is horrendous. I didn't realize how horrific it is and so on. So there were lots of these responses. And I think because we only have five minutes max, absolute max, um, I wonder if there was, <clears throat> there was one question. How can people get involved? Can they get involved with you or should they get more involved with us? Because, I mean, we are usually there at the courts. And we, But can they get directly involved? Besides of the fundraising, I have posted a fundraising link. Uh, thanks, Christy. Yes, indeed. Um, 
uh, both both routes really you know both through yourselves and through um, um, Stonehenge Alliance uh, I mentioned the petition please uh, advertise that tell your friends tell your family get everyone to sign it the more yeah. the more signatures we have the better um, just on questions Krista if anybody's got a burning question and they don't get an opportunity to ask it they can email me via the you'll find the e contact email on the safes on the Stone Angel Alliance website, yeah. and I'll will guarantee to answer any questions that people raise. Um, it's, let's if, do if we, that. Just just very briefly, if we lose this second case, which went to the uh, High Court in middle middle of December last year, if we, and we're waiting for the judgment to be handed down, maybe it will come tomorrow. We just don't know when. But if we lose that case subject to legal advice, we will go to appeal. And that will mean that we're gonna to have to raise another 50,000. Mm -hmm. And we're not here um, asking for funding at the moment, but again, just through helping our traction on social media, retweeting things, clicking on our Instagram page and so on and so forth, that all helps to raise awareness and hopefully get us to this 50,000 pound target if we need, if we need to raise further monies. I want to I want to really uh, stress that um, because we we usually try to uh, contribute and please people do this thing needs to be stopped it absolutely needs to be stopped and we haven't even uh, touched on the big spiritual uh, uh, component because this was really just to give you information and and to make you realize how massive this actually is. This is really uh, something we must, must, must fight. Uh, Tim Salis asked the question, uh, maybe we bring that one in. Should we contacting our MPs? Yes, please. Uh, please do. And on our website, again, you'll find sample letters that you can write. Again, we've had parliamentary questions. We've raised, we've um, mass mailed MPs, but it's much, much more effective if in, in your own locality, you can write to your own constituency MP. Yes, please. Yeah. And stonehengealliance.org.uk is the right website. Yes. Yeah. And if, you know, as usual, Krista, if you just Google Stonehenge Alliance, our website will come straight up. Yeah. It's, it's in the, it's in the chat, people. Open Thank you. The chat. Um, right. Yeah. And then I just convey a few more um, messages in a way rather than questions so if you have a really urgent one uh, get on to john it's in the contact at stonehenge alliance click into the contact uh, page and you will uh, be able to um, email them um somebody uh, said from italy italy has fought for a long 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 time to get certain things onto the world heritage uh, list and Britain is just throwing it away. How horrid is that? And it's really uh, something maybe to understand. Um, and then there was a lot of, as I said, people being appalled. Um, this is horrible and so on. So we are hoping that this will uh, encourage everybody uh, to join in and we must stop because the next speaker is waiting. I click out so Jonathan can join. Sure. Thank you, Krista. All of us. Thank you so much, John, for all of the background on that, for bringing us up to date with all of the information. And, and as you kind of see, there are people who haven't been kind of fully aware of and following everything that's been going on with it. So uh, we're really grateful to you for kind of giving kind of such a comprehensive background to it. And just more broadly, it is a small group of you that are working so, so hard with it. We can't imagine the stress and the, the that there's been with taking this to court and kind of with these legal challenges, uh, with raising the funds. And, you know, we are kind of massively indebted and grateful to you. And yeah. um, while there's continuing to need to be a fight to protect the, that sacred landscape there of Stonehenge, we will be with you to help. Thank you, Jonathan. Just, just let me say around. one thing in closing, and thank you for that, and thank you for the support of Sacred Earth Activism. Um, we're not giving up. That's what I leave you with. We're not giving up. And wherever you're fighting, don't give up. It's worth carrying on. Thanks very much, Jonathan.
Thank you. And those are very special last words. Thank you very much, John. And we look forward to staying in contact with you. Thank you.